Chris Hughes, and I'm the president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and a senior lecturer in chemistry at Columbia University. And I'm uh, very excited to be one of uh, today's facilitators. And I am Susan Chaberj, uh, co-founder of Climate Action Now here in Western Mass at Springfield Climate Justice Coalition. And I am so honored and delighted to be here with all of you today. And we're gonna start with just a little bit of um, business and then we'll get right to it. Uh, I wanted to let people know in terms of Zoom protocol that the chat is open right now. Please introduce yourself in the chat if you have not already, so we all know who's here. Um, and wanted to let you know that throughout the uh, two hours, organizers will be putting information in the chat. It will be closed to um, crosstalk, but there will be information in there, so do save the chat at the end. And I want to make sure everybody knew that this event is being recorded, but we will be recording the folks that are spotlighted. So um, if you do not want your face shown, then you can um, turn your screen off. And um, I wanted to give people a sense of what's going to be happening for the two hours so that you have a sense of the flow. Um, as soon as Ivana and I give a, a brief um, framing of the day. Uh, Timon will present briefly on warheads to windmills, and then we're going to have three panels. Panel one is focused on the climate crisis, and um, panel two is focused on nuclear weapons and disarmament, and panel three is focused on how we're gonna bring these two crucially important movements together. And what we're going to do is run a very tight um, schedule so that we can fit in a very ambitious vision that we have. So clearly this is the first in a series of conversations we're hoping to have. But each speaker will have four minutes to speak and then there'll be a little time for cross talk in the two panels, one, the, the climate and nuclear panel. And what we're, um, our intention is to have time at the end for everybody here to be in a breakout group where you can talk with each other about this very important work of bringing our movements together, amplifying, becoming um, more powerful to meet the urgency of the times. Well, I want people to know that we will be introducing panelists by their name only and their bios will be in the chat. And um, we um, will come together for a closing circle at 1.55, and we'll conclude by 2 p.m. Okay, so maybe we can all take a breath together and we can begin. We wanted to start by acknowledging that we are meeting together at a time of global anguish. And we wanted to write up front name that we imagine that many of you are feeling a range of emotions, despair, fear, anger, worry, overwhelm. Maybe some of us are feeling numb inside, but we are here in a common purpose. And if, if ever we, we should feel highly, highly motivated to address these issues, it's today. And we really appreciate everyone who's shown up today to um, explore these ex existential threats in a time when the world is literally on fire. And we really want to honor the community that we're creating here today. It's a brief time <coughs> It's a virtual space, but we're a community and we're here with a common intention and, and a common purpose. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much for the excellent introduction and, and um, those uh, heartwarming but sobering words. Um, today, we will be discussing two existential threats to our world, climate change and nuclear weapons. And the two movements that aim to address and climate change and nuclear weapons are deep and multidimensional. To underscore just some of the obvious, climate change is 
poised to increase the risk of conflict, which will in turn increase the risk of nuclear weapons use and catastrophe that would unfold as a result. In turn, the use of nuclear weapons could lead to nuclear war, which would cause nuclear winter leading to global famine and starvation of billions of people. This is not science fiction or a scenario from a dystopian novel. This is real and something that we have actually known about since the early 1980s, but that we have in fact uh, continued to build a better and better understanding of. Um, the work on nuclear winter most recently has been strengthened in fact by climate change research and models allowing us to gain a precise and detailed understanding of these impacts. To be sure, both climate change and nuclear weapons are existential threats to our world and must be addressed. At the simplest level, if we address one but, and solve it, but not the other, we will not have succeeded. We must work together and we must address both. Thank you so much for those uh, words of wisdom. And um, what we want to name right now is that in order to address both of these existential crises, we really need a paradigm shift and dialogue and community building are essential um, to, to begin this paradigm shift. So our purpose here today is let's help create that shift. And so I now, I say let the dialogue begin and Tim and Wallace will give us a five minute overview of the latest Warheads to Windmills. Thank you, Susan. And thanks Ivana for summarizing the book. Um, and thanks to everybody here for, for joining us. Um, as Susan said, uh, this forum is a follow-up from a webinar that took place in May. Uh, and some of you I'm sure were at that one. I gave a brief summary then of the report, the summary of our report, which um, came out in May, um, which uh, was an update from our 2019 report, which some of you may have seen. And um, we are now, well, this, this report in May actually said, you know, uh, on the back page, if anybody looked, it said the full report in book form will be available uh, on June 24th, which obviously is not the case. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, I'm glad to say it is going to come out soon, um, officially on uh, November 30th, uh, and this is what it's going to look like. Um, it's uh, a 400 page paperback with a lot of footnotes. Um, the reason for November 30th I'm quite excited about because it's um, going to be launched during the second meeting of states parties of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which happens to be taking place at the same time as the 28th meeting of the parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So uh, we're going to be having a live stream link up between climate activists who are going to be at the COP28 in Dubai and nuclear weapons activists who are going to be in New York to highlight the connections between these two existential threats, why they, uh, how, how we can work together more effectively, how we can learn from each other and build a really powerful movement. So that's what this book is about. It's, it's, uh, it's all about um, not just the facts and figures of climate and nuclear weapons, but also the myths and misunderstandings and half measures and false solutions that we've all been uh, struggling with up until now. And um, also about what we can do about all that. So uh, we know, for instance, that the president and the Congress will ultimately have to make the decisions that we need to end our dependence on fossil fuels and nuclear weapons. <clears throat> and we also know that they're not going to do that so long as their information and their advice and the money they need to get reelected comes from the very companies that are making huge profits from these things. So we know that we've got to put serious social and financial pressure on these companies if we have any hope of getting these companies to change their positions and therefore any hope of getting their own politicians to change their positions so this book is uh, a lot about strategy and tactics and how do we get to where we need to be we know that we can do this because we've done it before in relation to apartheid and the civil rights movement workers rights around the world have been through pressure on companies 
the Vietnam War, the decolonization of India, and loads of other issues have, have been addressed because people stood up to these companies and said enough. And this happened in relation to nuclear weapons back in the 1980s, when cities and towns across the US started divesting from nuclear weapons companies and refusing to enter into contracts with them. Churches, colleges, and millions of individual consumers started boycotting um, products made by the companies that also make nuclear weapons like Morton Salt and General Electric and Westinghouse and DuPont and Ford Motor Company. These, these had a huge impact in the 1980s. And when it comes to climate, of course, we're now uh, seeing this happen with over $20 trillion worth of um, assets being held back from the um, climate fossil fuel companies. And um, we know this, this can work, uh, but we know we also need a lot more of it. So um, this book is about trying to build a movement. Um, how do we work more effectively together, draw on the best practices and the best uh, of the best movements in, in our history, pulling together the best wisdom we have access to and, um, and doing what we can to, to address these two existential threats that, um, that Ivana was talking about. So um, that's how much time I have for. Um, you've seen my slideshow, which was um, primitive. And please buy the book, join the Warheads to Windmills Coalition, and come to the next webinar. Thanks. Thank you so much, Timon. And now we will move into the first panel, the climate panel. And we have two parts to this. The first is we're going to hear four minutes each from our speakers about uh, promising ideas, initiatives, things that are giving them encouragement and a sense of uh, momentum. And then we'll have some time for the panelists to um, talk with each other about how can we work together um, across um, sectors of the climate movement and the climate justice movement to amplify and strengthen our climate movement. And um, we will begin with Andy Hamry, who is going to talk about transportation. Hi, everyone. Give me one moment. Uh, just checking if my sound is coming through OK. It sounds Thumbs wonderful. Up. Go for it. You sound great. Wonderful. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you all. Um, please feel welcome to contact me anytime if I can be a resource for you. Um, I'm joining you today um, as a transportation scholar in my personal capacity. Um, and let's dig into it. Um, so we can do so much more than drive a uh, EVs. Um, I think much of our national and international discourse around climate change and transportation focuses on, um, on vehicles. And I just want to encourage us to kind of broaden those horizons and think about um, very readily available um, solutions around public transportation, walking and biking. We don't have to wait for technology to save us, um, AV uh, advancements and so forth. So um, there's lots of great uh, information uh, and momentum and policies around um, walking, biking, and public transportation. And uh, in particular, I think one of the most exciting advancements has been um, some of our work around incorporating public health concepts and safety into um, our work in transportation. And that has, I think, helped break through some of the kind of log jams we've had in terms of um, creating more space in the US for um, transit, biking and walking. So um, this is a, a new paper. It's getting a lot of attention about uh, sort of um, adopting concepts from public health uh, for traffic safety. Um, and one of the messages from these authors is to think of kinetic energy as a pathology. Some of you may be aware of the term vision zero, which we have um, learned from our friends in um, Scandinavia. Um, so I would really encourage you to um, check out this work and kind of think about um, safety as a, a, a helpful kind of concept for moving forward much of our work in sustainable transportation. Um, for further reading, I would really recommend Jesse Singer's book on um, there are no accidents. Um, I also want to encourage you to think about be, becoming a YIMBY for zoning, housing, and parking reform in your community. Um, I uh, will recommend the Parking Reform Network. Uh, it's, it's kind of amazing the last few years just how much 
momentum there has been around um, removing these minimum parking requirements. I offer also a recent book on zoning reform. Um, walking, biking, and transit is very difficult when things are so spread out. Where we where we live and where we're going is when it's really um, spread out, it becomes a lot less feasible, and and we have to default to driving in many cases. So. Um, these kinds of reforms make those options more feasible. Oops, excuse me. And my last line um, is just sharing a few more exciting kind of cutting edge uh, policy reforms. Something called intelligent speed assistance has been around for a long time. Walk America has a safer fleets challenge. They are challenging uh, municipal fleets to implement this readily available technology. Uh, as kind of a leader in, in adopting this safety technology. Check out if your community is, is part, uh, part of this or and if not, advocate for it. Um, there's a lot of momentum around electric bicycle incentives. Check out if your city or state is working on that. Weight-based uh, vehicle registrations, I find a lot of hope for. Again, that idea of sort of kinetic energy as a pathology. I think this is a really compelling application from it. Um, one, there's a one minute remaining, just to let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and um, there's there's more in uh, from America Walks earlier this year had a um, a, a message uh, uh, a webinar on um, tr policy trends, and uh, I offer this paper on uh, more effective interventions. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you so much, Andy. That was. Perfect, so much information in such a short amount of time. We really appreciate that. And now we'd like to bring on Audrey Shulman. Audrey, are you ready to go here? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna share screen if that's okay. Well, yes, please do. Okay, hold on. So, so I'm gonna talk about the future of clean heat. Uh, hopefully you're seeing my presentation. Yes. Uh, it is uh, offered by a variety of senators and reps. I'm going very quickly. Currently in Massachusetts, about 20% of our infrast our gas infrastructure, natural gas infrastructure under the street is leak prone. Uh, but meanwhile, customers are getting off the gas system, going to uh, heat air source heat pumps. That means that for the gas customers remaining, the costs of the infrastructure have not decreased in any way at all. In, you know, it's a fixed system, fixed costs. Um, and so the gas customers remaining, their costs are going higher as they have to shoulder more and more of the energy burden of uh, paying for that gas infrastructure. At some point, the, there'll be an inflection point hit and everybody will get off except for the low income. That will be a disaster. And that will result probably in a lot less gas workers and a more unsafe system. Uh, here's the current number of uh, gas system uh, replacements currently planned in Massachusetts, like I said, over 20%, that cost will be paid for by our kids and our grandkids over the next 50 years. That's ridiculous. So the future of clean heat instead allows the gas utilities to transition to non-combusting thermal infrastructure, such as networked geothermal, which is a networked ground source heat pumps underneath the ground. Uh, same pipes, you know, pumping thermal, not same pipes, same sort of pipes, pumping thermal energy through the ground, returning it back to temperature with the temperature of the ground. If they're allowed to do that, they can, the, the customer's costs will go down and uh, the system will be safer because it does not have explosive gas in it. Eversource and National Grid are already installing such infrastructure. And what this system, well, I'm gonna skip this fast. Um, what this bill would do is would allow them to figure out a plan, which would be great, <laughs> and invest in non-emitting, non-combusting infrastructure, transition whole streets at a time. Uh, and for some, uh, um, for some reason, the show will not continue, uh, and uh, many, many other things it's supposed to do. I cannot talk about this bill. It's a bill that you drop on the floor and it makes us thud, it's so big. Um, and so uh, I uh, look forward to any discussion, but what it would allow is the gas utilities to stop spending over $40 billion on new fossil fuel gas infrastructure and instead move towards renewable non-combusting infrastructure. Thanks. Thank you so much, 
Audrey, and um, we've heard this is such exciting developments in transportation and heating and cooling. And now we're going to touch on the incredible importance of our forests. And Susan Messino has some um, very interesting comments. So Susan, you are up. Thank you so much. And thank you to Timon and everyone for this really visionary um, and interdisciplinary event, which is um, really what I'm interested in. So I'm um, trained primarily as a neuroscientist and very interested in health and come from kind of a first do no harm perspective. And uh, as my career and my life has evolved, it's boiled down to two points that I'd like to emphasize. The first thing is that we absolutely need nature, no matter what the carbon is in the atmosphere, um, no matter what, we need natural systems for, for everything. And the other critical thing is we need to keep our brains in good health. And the good news is that these two things actually can work together to support each other. Um, I'd also like to mention that, that natural areas, not only are they storing carbon and regulating water and preventing floods and providing biodiversity, um, there's a lot of research showing that they help us to be more creative and to experience awe and empathy and altruism. And I wanted to just share this uh, quote that I think of often from Dr. Diana Beresford Kroger, who has a phenomenal movie, The Call of the Forest, that an intact forest is an act of peace. And we know that we need peace to thrive and be everything that we can be. So the bad news that I wanna share with you is that we have very little land, very little natural areas that's provided to be intended as a natural system. Most of our landscape is open to manipulation and extraction. And scientists recommend that we need 30 to 50% of our land in as intact as possible. It doesn't mean moving people out. It doesn't mean banning people or banning anything. It means being careful first do no harm. We need to set up sort of a triage system with our lands so they're not damaging and manipulating areas that are healthy or recovering. And this is really critical. And I'm a co-author on a report that just came out, first of its kind in New England called Wildlands in New England. Um, where are they? And so wildlands are these natural areas similar to a national park. Um, and the key thing right now is deciding what we're doing where and why, and where are the wildlands. And here is um, a bit of information to add to that, that you know we know we're one of so many species and there's so much we don't know about our natural system. So one of the simplest things we can do is try and make sure that everyone has access to a piece of our natural heritage in cities and in blue and green rivers that cross our country and the world. This is our, our lifeline, our ecological lifeline. And these natural systems have evolved as climate regulating ecosystems. It's our most powerful opportunity to stabilize the climate. That's why these systems evolved and their role is stabilizing the climate for themselves. So we need to be really careful. Um, just to show you where these wildlands are in southern New England, which if you've been is a beautiful area right now in the fall, these are areas that right now have a wildlands intent. Um, it's a lot of little state areas, but you can see that that's a very, very tiny amount of the landscape. It's only about 2% of Massachusetts, 1% of Connecticut, and there's nothing in Rhode Island. And most of that intent is temporary, it's not permanent. So there's really no long-term protection for these natural systems. If we look at Connecticut, these are all of the wildlands in Connecticut, but only the gray areas in the upper left corner have a long-term protection as literally just a little area for nature that we all should be able to experience. And that sort of thread that you see is the Appalachian Trail, which was originally envisioned as sort of a wilderness way. Um, so Isn't, if we what, remove the areas that- One minute remaining, one minute. Perfect. Okay. If we remove the areas that uh, only have temporary protection, 
this is what we have in Connecticut. So one of the things that I want to emphasize about climate justice and environmental justice is this is something we all need and that no one has long-term long -term confidence that they'll be able to access. And this is how we can stabilize everything and promote peace and provide healthy brains and clean water and everything we need. And I'll post a little bit more information in the chat and thank you so much for this wonderful event. Thank you, Susan, that was amazing. And I think um, I'm, I'm gonna hold with me that idea that every forest is, uh, is a place of peace and an act of peace. Well, when we build movements, one of the key things is we need to address Someone needs to be muted. Um, when, as we as we talk about these various issues, we know that what we really need is a movement, a powerful movement. And if it's going to be powerful, it needs to be based on climate justice. And Naya Tenerowitz is here to talk about some very exciting work happening in uh, Springfield and movement building and climate justice and shutting down the dirty gas industry. So Naya. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, in my opinion, a lot of the most meaningful and important work is being done in the frontline communities that are targeted by polluting and hazardous industries like Springfield and who are getting hit first and worst by the climate crisis. Um, it, on, I want to talk about that at the US, like more local scale and then at the international scale. Uh, my work is within the kind of local scale. Um, we in Springfield are, it's kind of like, you know, we get targeted by one project and we get targeted by another. Currently our, our work is mostly focused on fighting uh, a proposed pipe, gas expansion pipeline that Eversource Gas wants to build from the town next to us through our like environmental justice, already highly polluted uh, neighborhoods that are already dealing with high rates of respiratory illness and really do not need an increased amount of methane in the air or to have their streets dug up. Um, so we are fighting this, you know, as a kind of underdog grassroots movement. And I, I'm kind of bringing that perspective to, to here. It's often about something urgent, localized, and an immediate threat. It, uh, it, you, but you can take something small and make it into something bigger. Um, the system is against you. And often in this case has decided that we are disposable and an acceptable loss. Um, but we have people power and people power is how we win. And we have solidarity and solidarity is how we win. Um, and in terms of taking something small and making something bigger out of our campaign has come a campaign for uh, a moratorium on all new gas system expansions in Massachusetts until we have a concrete plan for a just and rapid transition to the clean energy future that we need. So we're pushing for that as uh, we're petitioning the government the, the, the governor to pass an executive order for that. And we also have, have like legislation in the house. So we're taking this one immediate urgent threat that we're fighting and we're taking it into a bigger scale that will benefit not only us, but everyone else in Massachusetts. Um, and that's, it's really connected in with Audrey's presentation when she was talking about the gas system and heating and, and the changes that we need to make. Uh, and the changes that some gas utilities are making in some fronts, and I'm on the other front where gas utilities are trying to entrench themselves and we're fighting against them to try and get them to commit to that transition. I also wanna just briefly talk about the international scale um, where we need to follow the leadership, just as we need to, we need solidarity with environmental justice communities in, in the US within our local areas. We need other groups to be in solidarity with us and to follow our leadership because we know our own realities best. Um, on the international scale, we need to follow the leadership of frontline nations, the global south and island nations in particular. Uh, the wealth that built industrialization, the wealth that has caused the climate crisis was extracted from those nations, the profit and resources was drained to them at the drained from them at the beginning of industrialization, and that still happens. Millions of dollars extracted every year, leaving them without the resources that they need to protect themselves against the impacts of the climate crisis, which they have contributed to the least and are facing the impact of first. Um, so I'm just I feel very strongly that as citizens of countries of the global north, that it is our duty to 
push for our our uh, communities, our our countries to share our resources um, with those countries of the global south, uh, because we literally owe them that those resources and that money. Um, and those resources are reparations, and those are very much needed. So as we're talking about this change, as we're talking about addressing these enormous barriers that we're facing, these enormous risks, we need to be keeping that in mind and keeping in mind that it's not just about us and our resources. It's about the history of what has happened to this world and the other people in this world and what we owe to them. Um Thank you for wrapping up your remarks in a minute or less, if possible. Yeah, I can. I just have a little bit more. Part of that's sharing resources and reparations. Part of that's taking in climate refugees. And part of that is listening to their realities and following their leadership. Frontline leadership, I, I cannot express the importance of that enough. Solidarity and allyship with frontline groups, with frontline nations is absolutely pivotal if this movement is going to have a true commitment to climate justice. Thank you so much, Naya. So much in so few, so few minutes. And now we we have um the this amazing group of folks uh, talking about climate. And we have a few minutes to have some cross conversation with our climate panelists. And our question is how can we work together to strengthen an climate justice movement. We know that um, our time is very short and um, we know that um, we need to build power as rapidly as possible. So I'd like to open up this space for our panelists and see who would like to begin. Um, I, I could offer just a, a, a brief remark. Um, I, uh, my dissertation was on transport justice. Um, I've learned a lot from uh, Carl Martins and um, Peter Norton on, on this. Um, uh, Peter Norton talks about asking the right question. We, we used to ask, how do we make a safer cigarette? And then we freed ourselves from that idea. And we asked, how, how can we help people stop smoking, right? So he talks about how we have been stuck on this idea of how do we make, um, make better cars or fit more cars into our into our um, communities and and we need to challenge ourselves to think how do we free ourselves from the idea, the idea of car dependence um so i just want to offer let's ask the the right questions and um i i see so much alignment with the concept of justice across sustainability affordability equity safety um and so i think we do so well when we when we sort of um think of the alignments um uh, in that way i'll just offer those. Wonderful. Other thoughts that folks have? So uh, I would say that it's uh, that we need to transition quickly by aligning everybody. Uh, we've seen the, the difficulties uh, with when we when we ask for natural gas bans, there is a huge pushback. I personally was at the Cambridge city of Cambridge uh, council meeting where they discuss the idea of a gas ban there. And at that meeting, which is normally attended by like three people, there were 150 people with a lot of mothers out front folks, a lot of gas workers, the head of Eversource gas and, and others. Um, and everybody was ready to break into fisticuffs. Uh, and if you look at a map of the gas bans across the country, you will see a lot of blue states having gas bans and a lot of red states having bans against gas bans. And that is not a way to move forward quickly. That instead we have to have everybody moving forward in the same direction really quickly. And so what we try to do is align uh, you know, everybody, gas workers, gas executives, uh, you know, climate advocates like me, um, uh, industry, low income advocates, et cetera, to all understand that this is the best way forward. And that's how we need to move forward. Um, that's the fastest way and the only just way. Thank you. I so want to say, yeah, go ahead, Naya, please jump in. Uh, I want to say that there's, there's so many connections between all of our different areas of work, but we can't discover those connections unless we get in the same spaces and 
listen to each other. All of us can be students of each other. All of us have a different expertise, a different perspective. Uh, and I really think that the the way forward is by building those connections between us, by building those relationships, by building an understanding of what each other are doing and opening dialogues of like, okay, this this is what matters to us. This is what matters to you. How do we build the connections here? How do we show up for each other? It's It's not just you know, getting people on board your campaign. It's also, you know, showing up for other people's action alerts of like, okay, that like we're calling for solidarity action. It's, I, I think that what we need to do is we need to build a community of solidarity and a community where we, we respect each other's expertise and we come to each other as students and teachers and collaborators all at once. Such a great point. And I, Susan, I did want to bring you in, Susan, and point out that one of the ways that we have moved toward more collaboration in the climate movement is um, from an initial uh, tremendous focus on keeping dirty energy in the ground, which of course is essential. Um, it took a while for people to, full, to, to begin to grasp the enormity of the role of our forests and regenerative farming. And um, Susan has been a voice that's been speaking out about that. And to have us be able to understand that we need to keep it in the ground and we need to protect the one technology we have that isn't a fantasy, which is forests. Um, and I'd love to have Susan speak to that a bit. Yeah, I'd just like to really emphasize what the other speakers said. We have to stop allowing ourselves to get divided. Mm -hmm. And I found this out unexpectedly when I started trying to advocate just for community forests or old growth forests, that suddenly I was labeled someone who's anti-forestry, which is not true at all. We need to decide what we're doing where and why. Um, I'm also in favor of affordable housing, but I don't think we should be cutting down old growth forests for it. There is, you know, very, very common sense solutions to a lot of these problems and some of them are not even expensive and when i was um, the co-chair of the governor's science and technology working group for climate change in connecticut we engaged in a uh, uh, process called multi-solving which brings people across all different disciplines and one key thing is you have to have the whole system engage and you can't let conflicts of interest dominate. And one of the problems we have right now is most of these processes involve stakeholders that are all fighting for their own turf. We have to engage people with expertise that are willing to work across disciplines on common solutions and then forge those alliances as powerfully as possible and stop getting divided and fighting each other. It's awful. That's so well said, um, so important. Um, other thoughts that, that people have, and maybe I'll just, while you're thinking, um, I wanna make one point that I think we're learning more and more, which is um, we simply cannot depend on the federal government. We can't rely totally on the state government. What we've seen, and, and in the work that I've been doing with Naya and Springfield is, um, uh, we were recently able to defeat a biomass plant 12, 12 year struggle in Springfield and also to have a, a change in statewide regulations. And the key to winning it, it wasn't just counting on our legislators to pass, pass good legislation. It was when people really got on board across this state around the urgency of supporting climate justice and not letting Springfield be a sacrifice zone. And so it was a powerful mass movement. And even though it was during the pandemic, we won. It was a huge victory. And that's why we have got to, we've got to build those ties and understand that there's not one solution to address the climate emergency. We need multiple solutions. We need to have each other's backs. So I'd love to hear other folks' thoughts. We have just a few more minutes in our crosstalk. Um, other reflections that people have? I, I just wanted to say one thing I didn't mention before. I'm actually at an event right now um, at Tufts University hosted by Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. 
um, and their website is bioforclimate.org. And they're looking at a whole range of solutions kind of built on our natural infrastructure. And one thing I've become very aware of that I wanted to share here is that um, we, we focus so much on carbon in the atmosphere, but there's a lot of new research and, and actually some of it's not that new that the water dynamics are really critical in terms of our global temperatures. And yet all of our policies are built on carbon and some of those policies are doing bad math. So we need some really serious analysis and um, open-mindedness to science. It's actually, I think, a an, an diversity and equity and inclusion issue that some scientific voices are being shut out. That's not acceptable. Science is never 100% settled. We have to keep on thinking through these things and making sure we don't make wrong turns. We're, we don't have time for that. Thank you so much. Anaya, please. I think that's a really great point that we need to be open to evolving understandings. We need to be open to, you know, hearing things that aren't what we thought was, you know, what what's up. Um, and I, I want to use that as a, a point to mention something that I failed to mention in my previous bit, which is we need to listen to Indigenous voices. The They have the, they have been coexisting with this land for millennia. And in the, the few hundred years that colonization has been going on, we have done so much damage. Um, so I just really want to make that a call to learn about your local indigenous communities, uh, see how you can support them, and just in general support indigenous sovereignty and land back as a solution and as a way of bringing ourselves back into like harmony and, and uh sustainability and good relation with the land. Thank you so and much. water. Yeah, thank you so much, Naya. It, you know, when it really comes down to basic principles, that is such a key point. And also when there's a frontline community and a fight, and this is very connected to that, that it's the folks who are on the ground the closest to the struggle that really need to have leadership of that. And that brings in the whole realm of what it means to make a just transition to clean, renewable, green energy. And so if we can really listen to indigenous voices, listen to the people on the front lines, build solidarity across our movement, show up for each other. And instead of arguing about who has the correct answer, see that this is a complex multifaceted issue and we need everyone on board in every possible way. So, Unless anybody else wants to drop in a final word, we're going to move to our next um, panel. But yes, Andy, it looks like you have a final thought here. No? Okay, so I want to thank you all so much, and we're going to continue. This is a great example, let me say, of the dialogue that's going to lead to the paradigm shift. And I, I, I truly appreciate all of you for your sharing. And now we're going to move to looking at how we can support efforts to um, end nuclear weapons. Thank you all, and uh, we'll be hearing from you later. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, I think Brian will spotlight me. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you to all of the panelists, um, really, for the excellent remarks and discussion. Uh, this is such an important issue, and I'm I'm really thrilled and, and encouraged uh, by the discussion uh, that, that just occurred. So we are now going to talk about nuclear weapons. Um, and this, of course, is a topic that, as Tim and highlighted, had very much been on the public's mind, in particular in the 1980s, but had um, in more recent decades really receded from consciousness even as the threat actually um, never went away. So we are going to hear from three leaders about some of uh, the efforts that are going on today at both the local and the national level. And then we'll talk more um, at the end of similar sort of setup as with the climate panel. We'll talk um, at the end about how we, all of these efforts can come together. So. First, we'll be hearing from Paul Gunter, who is going to speak about nuclear free zones. If we can spotlight Paul, that would be great. 
Thank you, Paul. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to present on the establishment of nuclear free zones. Uh, nuclear free zones are the epitome of act local, think global, just as we can no longer safely and responsibly operate in a bubble at the expense of effectively using democracy to protect our planet and our climate <clears throat> from accelerating existential threats. Tacoma Park, Maryland, which is where I am, uh, just outside of Washington, DC, is coming up on its 40th anniversary as <clears throat> a nuclear free zone established on December 15, 1983, uh, by a uh, municipal city code under health and safety as the Nuclear Free Zone Act. In the wake of the confrontation of the Cold War, the act established the city as a nuclear free zone to prohibit the development of nuclear weapons at the very foundation of our democracy, local government and civil society working together. The act amended over the decades recognizing, and I quote, residents and representatives are urged to redirect resources previously used for nuclear weapons and nuclear power generation towards endeavors which promote and enhance life. Tacoma Park is, is the only remaining recognized nuclear free zone of four municipalities in the Washington DC area uh, established as part of a nuclear-free America network that once blossomed across the United States. However, Spokane, Washington, and New York City are two of the most recent cities to be declared nuclear-free zones. But what was special about the Tacoma Park Nuclear Free Zone Act was that it established the Nuclear Free Tacoma Park Committee. Nine local residents with experience and interest in the nuclear disarmament movement assigned to educate the community to the nuclear threat and maintain oversight of the city contracts and financing for compliance with the nuclear free ordinance. The act was set up to be vigilant of our local government's investments, specifically for industries and institutions that quote, knowingly and contractually engaged in the production of nuclear weapons or their components. The committee used ESG networks and then the ICANN Don't Bank on the Bomb Guide to monitor the city financial institutions. But opportunities also present struggles. For the past decade, the committee has doggedly pointed out to the city government that its banking and finances have long been subsumed and managed by banks heavily invested in nuclear weapons. First SunTrust Bank, then Truist Bank, both enlisted on the Don't Bank on the Bomb. Which brings us to today. Tacoma Park still has the nuclear free zone signs noticed at the city limits, but this year the mayor and city council declined to make reappointments to the committee itself. Instead, the city is reassigning those duties and responsibilities to city staff, and the city attorney is looking over making changes to the Nuclear Free Zone Act itself. So we're right now engaged in a process by which um, an ad hoc nuclear free committee is uh, working to reinstate the, uh, the city committee um, and, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's generally recognized that the power of banking institutions and the nuclear industry itself are a major point of conflict and struggle that the overall movements is, is going to have to face head on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. That was really excellent. I love the, I love that you brought up the issue of of financing and funding. And this has, of course, been um, uh, a, a concern that people are um, trying to deal with uh, both uh, nationally and internationally. And I also love the parallel between local nuclear free zones 
And of course, the regional nuclear weapons free zones that we, um, you know, trying to get us to where the whole world actually. Evelyn Miller. Um, and Evelyn is going to speak about um, the uh, Commission on Nuclear Weapons and Climate. So welcome, Evelyn. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm just going to touch on how people can get involved in nuclear disarmament, which is obviously a tremendously large and intimidating task, um, but how we can still get involved at the local and state levels. So um, as an intern at Massachusetts Peace Action, I work primarily on the Climate Action and Nuclear Disarmament United Campaign, which, as the title suggests, works on bringing together the nuclear disarmament and climate movements to address these twin existential threats in tandem. And we're working on a lot of ways to get people involved, activists and non-activists alike. And one great way to get involved is to support efforts to pass legislation at the state and federal levels. And for this, we need the help of everyone because policymakers are forced to take into consideration, of course, the wishes of their constituents. So one great way to get involved is just supporting, yeah, these efforts to get legislation passed. And what everyone can do is contact their legislators, urging them to support piece of legislation X because it's important. And so, as you mentioned, one piece of legislation that we really need to do this for at the state level in Massachusetts is the Citizens Commission Bill. Um, if passed, this bill would establish a special Citizens Commission to conduct a study for making the transition away from the nuclear weapons industry in Massachusetts towards the development and production of green technologies needed to address the climate emergency. So this is super important given the scale of nuclear weapons production in the state of Massachusetts, um, as Mass is the home of several large facilities owned by major nuclear weapons contractors. Um, and the commission would be composed of 11 individuals who are experienced and interested in implementing the green transition in Massachusetts and also the transition away from nuclear weapons production. So broken down, you know, they would study the extent to which jobs and businesses, communities, just in general, Massachusetts society is dependent on the nuclear weapons industry and the extent to which funds under the control of the state of Massachusetts are invested in the industry. Um, figuring out this is of course necessary to instigate the transition that we need um, in Massachusetts and then eventually at the national level and international level and Massachusetts can set an example for um, other states to follow and as well as um, at the federal level. And so again, what people can do is just let um, their legislators know in Massachusetts that we need to pass this piece of legislation. There's currently a version in the state house and Senate, both of which have had hearings and are in committees. So you can look these up and message the committee members and tell them that this, this bill needs to get out of committee and it needs to get a vote at both the house floor and Senate floor. And if you are outside of Massachusetts, an easy thing you can do is just send a message to your reps saying we need a version of this in our state um, because this commission is super important and it's a really great way for us to sort of instigate this transition specifically to nuclear disarmament but also to um, clean energy. Thank you. Excellent, Evelyn. Thank you so much. Um, and now we are going to hear from Bob Dodge, who will be speaking about the Back from the Brink campaign. And we can spotlight Bob. Perfect. Thank you so much. Just go ahead and unmute yourself for us, Bob. The floor is yours. Got it. All right. I need just a second. Okay. I love it. Love technology. So, at any rate, thank you so much for having this opportunity to be here today. Uh, 
So I'm presenting on behalf of Back from the Brink. Uh, Back from the Brink is a US-based grassroots intersectional coalition of individuals, organizations, and elected officials working together for a world free of nuclear weapons while advocating for common sense nuclear weapons policies to secure a safer, uh, more just uh, future. Back from the Brink recognizes the urgency of the situation and the moment and realizing that following the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons adoption in 2017, we recognized that the United States and the other nuclear nations were not likely to sign, so we needed to build a movement. Our movement calls on the United States to lead a global effort to prevent nuclear war through the following policy solutions. One, actively pursuing a verifiable agreement among nuclear nations to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. Two, renouncing the option of using nuclear weapons first. Three, ending the sole unchecked authority of any US president to launch a nuclear attack. Four, taking our weapons off hair trigger alert and five, canceling the plan to replace the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal with enhanced weapons at a cost of $1.7 trillion. With the United States this year, fiscal year 2023, spending over $90 billion on all nuclear weapons programs. As with ICANN, which has over 650 partner organizations, Back from the Brink recognizes the connection and intersectionality of all aspects of our society and has developed a broad support and endorsement across the spectrum from 467 organizations. And I'm pleased to note that both of our facilitators organizations today are endorsers. In addition, 76 municipalities and counties, seven state legislative bodies, 334 municipal and state officials, and 41 members of Congress. We've achieved this by finding common ground and cause in our communities, and by community organizing and developing relationships. Here are just a few of the organizations that are endorsing our campaign, and some of the cities. Today, as we address the interconnected existential threats of climate change and nuclear war, it's significant that Back from the Brink has been endorsed by so many environmental organizational groups, including 350.org, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Sierra Club. As we have built public support and organizing support, we have also built political will and congressional support with the introduction this year of, of House Resolution 77 by Massachusetts Representative Jim McGovern. HRES 77 embraces the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, making nuclear disarmament the centerpiece of national security policy and endorses each of the back from the brink policy solutions. Excuse me, Bob, if I may just mention, we, we cannot see your slides. I'm not sure if you were planning to share your slides or not. Oh, okay. And we are also, um, we have some time, but we have a, a few minutes remaining. Thanks, Bob. And I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to. Okay. Sorry. Is they, can you see them now? Can you see the slides now? Yes, we can see yeah. them now. Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. You still see him? Yes. yes. Okay, great. I'm so sorry. Anyway, community support again. Uh, okay. And now we're having trouble. Oh, great. Okay, here we go. All right. The cities, again, the environmental groups. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. and House Resolution 77. Again, significantly, this resolution endorses all the policy points of Back from the Brink and includes specific language about seeking agreement with the Russian Federation before 2026, when the New START Treaty expires. As of today, 41 members of Congress representing roughly 10% of Congress have sponsored the resolution. I would ask if each of your members of Congress has also co-sponsored. Perhaps the easiest action you can do today is to join us. Thank you. And I'm so sorry the slides did not show. Thank you. And I can show you real quick. I'll just review real quick, just so you can see. Again, here was who, back from the brink. Our policy solutions. Who's on board? 
finding community, community organizing, part of the organizations, municipalities, and environmental groups. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Bob. And I, I apologize that I didn't point out that the slides weren't showing. I, I thought maybe you were um, you were just giving us the information, but the visuals definitely help. Uh, so I'm glad we could get those in at least at the at the very end. Um, let me just see if we can bring all of the panelists now together for a brief discussion. We have about 10 minutes or so um, before we have to move to our next panel for a brief discussion of how we can work together. And here, of course, there's a conundrum in a way Right, that this is the movement that was able to put over a million people in Central Park um, in uh, 1982. And yet today, this is um, rarely mentioned. Of course, the, the global picture has changed with the Ukraine war that has certainly raised some um, awareness. The Oppenheimer movie has certainly raised some awareness, although it didn't give us answers to all the questions we should have had um, after watching the film. And even today, um, as the conflict continues um, in Israel and Gaza, um, I think we're all aware uh, that the human suffering is, of course, one and, and, and terribly uh, devastating dimension, but that, that this is the kind of conflict that could lead um, to a wider regional war and that could even lead to use of nuclear weapons. So how can we get the public back to recognize that we continue to have nuclear weapons, that in fact, more than 12,000 of them around the world, um, and that these weapons uh, represent a threat to all of us, to all of humanity, um, and far from uh, actually keeping us safe, uh, they are putting all of humanity and potentially all of life on the planet at risk. So let me just open that up. And, and in terms of the kind of work you're all doing, um, how do we get back that, that energy, that enthusiasm, that excitement? Um, uh, and, and how, and, and the next panel, panel will talk about this. Uh, I was really encouraged by Bob saying that the environmental organizations have also endorsed um, uh, um, Back from the Brink. Paul, go ahead. Well, I think that, um, you know, again, you know, even though our, right now we are engaged in a struggle to get the Nuclear Free Committee back on uh, the, uh, as uh, appointed by the uh, city council, uh, we're proceeding with local education projects in spite of that all. Uh, there, um, you know, there is um, there is a small community that needs to be activated, um, and it needs to be activated around specific events. So I think that the uh, you know there is a responsibility, uh, particularly now for um, individuals, for small groups, um, for organizations to get out there into your, in your communities and uh, organize events. They're not that um, cost, uh, you know, they're not a big cost item, um, but um, nevertheless, I believe that the public is no less aware of the threat now than they were in 1983. Uh, you know, when um, uh, when the Tacoma Park Nuclear Free Zone Act was enacted. But, and as I mentioned, there are still communities like New York City has recently become a nuclear free zone, Spokane, Washington, and these are all uh, quite recent. Uh, so uh, it's really about, um, again, I think taking the, the local venue um, and uh, magnifying it on the global issue. Excellent. Thank you, Paul, for sharing. Bob, go ahead. Yes, you know, I think it's uh, an issue we need to acknowledge both the connection, and this was described in the environmental panel, the connection between all of our interests from whatever your organizational uh, and the intersectionality. 
I, you know, I would possibly disagree with Paul. Again, it's interesting. I think uh, for those of us on this call, which many of us are quite senior, we have not forgotten the nuclear threat, but young people aren't necessarily aware. That said, I find it's a very easy sell when I go out and talk to new audiences, when they're made aware of, oh, how many weapons, what's the risk, what's the climate risk, what's the risk to everything I care about, uh, I think they, they actually easily sign on. So I think the key is building coalitions. And, and we have to avoid the savior complex, like we've come to save them. You know, they're very involved, whether it's, you know, I don't care if it's Black Lives Member, it's it matter, the Sierra Club, they have their interests. So we're not there to save them, but we're there to join them, make the connection and work together. And that's the critical component as we build coalitions across the, the land and, and seek out these resolutions at, at local, state and, and national levels. Excellent. Thank you, Bob. Evelyn, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, to build off of what Robert just said, I think specifically combining these two movements, nuclear disarmament and climate action into one single movement, because as we've discussed, um, especially with the younger generation, we're, we have a lot of people who care about climate. Nuclear is not there. So a great way is just to show people the intersectionality here and all of the connections here. And then that will help wake people up. Um, and as you said, also just spreading that information, but specifically connecting it, I think, to the climate movement to gain the momentum that it needs because that movement does have a lot and that's just going to be a great way i think to get people also caring about the the threat of nuclear no that's excellent evelyn thank you all so much i i really appreciate these comments um i think uh, i i i'm also you know with bob in that i find that young people are not aware of the threat but when you do tell them and i and i do this all the time they do really care what i find is really also key is that you can't just tell them about the threat you can't just tell them about what's at stake which is literally humanity uh and human civilization you have to actually also give them the solution and of course there um, amongst all of these um, excellent efforts and initiatives at the local and, and national level here in the United States, we do now actually have an international treaty, um, a, a, a legally binding treaty that bans and prohibits nuclear weapons. And I think that kind of a development is really, um, I mean, to me, incredibly exciting. Uh, and, and I think it's something that that young people can also really um, rally around. I want to just raise the issue of uh, funding, because, of course, um, since we're talking about both climate change and nuclear weapons, it sort of seems like a no brainer, right? Because in one case, you actually have to stop spending money, right, on nuclear weapons. And in the other case, you actually do need resources and funds to address um, the, the threat of climate change adequately. Um, and so I just wanted to, and, and the, the issue of intersectionality has come up. I just wanted to raise that and see if any of you wanted to comment a little, a little further about sort of what are we doing when we spend literally billions of dollars a year? And, and in the case of the United States, um, possibly some estimates go up to $2 trillion uh, for our modernization of, of our arsenals. What, what's at stake? What, how, how is this even possible? Uh, so let me just throw that as a question. Anyone wants to? We have about three or four minutes. Well, I'll just start by saying that um, once you start looking at the financial entrenchment of the nuclear industry, particularly the weapons industry, um, it's like discovering an iceberg. And you know what you see is only a portion of what's at stake for this industry. Um, and it runs very deep. And again, we saw, you know, we discovered it in the banking industry. <clears throat> and um, that's a critical <clears throat> juncture that, um, you know, we need to address. Um, and it is uh, deeply entrenched, uh, not only in our, um, uh, uh, the structures of our government, but in our personal lives as well. I mean, that, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a deep introspection to look at 
how deeply uh, invested this country is in nuclear weapons. And it means some very fundamental changes. <clears throat> and it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, I would excellent point. Go ahead, Bob. If I'd like to chime in. So again, I, I, echoing what Paul's saying, I mean, it is, it's a very difficult challenge. And, and you know, unfortunately, uh, nuclear weapons in particular, but the defense industry has become a jobs program, which was never the intent of the founding fathers, et cetera. Uh, so they, they put a widget in each community, et cetera, you know, again, as part of the nuclear complex. That said, for over 30 years, I, I've directed what's called the Nuclear Weapons Community Cost Project. Uh, where we calculate what the United States is spending on all programs nuclear. And this year, fiscal year 23, uh, it's over $90 billion. And so uh, on the project, we actually identify what each city is paying, what Tacoma, Washington is paying, what Santa Barbara is paying, what Ojai is paying, uh, you know, again, Northampton, et cetera. So what you pay, you can actually look and identify if you want to calculate your individual tax dollars going to all programs. But that said, I have also found it to be a very reasonable tool to engage and to connect with individuals. Some people who may be very conservative and say, well, you know, we, uh, you know, I think we need to fund this and this and this. And I say, well, you know, we're funding nuclear weapons for this amount. How do you think for your pet project? And so it actually is a bridge, I think, some of the financing. But obviously it robs from every part of our society to, to invest and build these nuclear weapons complexes. So. Absolutely. Thank you, Bob. Any parting words from any of you? Evelyn, well, did you want I think to add that, anything? Uh, All right, yeah, go ahead, Paul, go ahead. I was just to add on, you know, I we'd be surprised at how um, huge the um, investment of <clears throat> the nuclear industry runs into, um, uh, you know, uh, Things like um, police uh, retirement funds, or you know, the retire particularly the retirement industry. Um, it, you know, the industry is very smart in where it's invested its money. Um, <clears throat> so uh, again, it uh, we're struggling with putting our arms around an iceberg, <clears throat> which I, I appreciate Bob's <clears throat> you know efforts to expose those numbers. Absolutely. Absolutely. We can't, again, we, we have to know both what's at stake and uh, what it is that we are in fact missing by continuing to um, uh, develop and modernize and, and just maintain these weapons, even when it comes to just maintaining them, they're incredibly, incredibly expensive. So thank you all so much. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to Susan, who's going to moderate our last panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Well, now we get to have the challenge of putting together um, the ideas and the actions um, around climate justice and addressing the climate emergency and the urgency of addressing nuclear weapons. And we have um, some panelists that are going to speak about that briefly, and then we're going to get folks into breakout rooms so we can hear everybody's voices. I'm sure you're all thinking and have, have a lot to say. So um, I'd like to start with uh, Vicki Elson, who is going to begin to address the issue of bringing these two crucial movements together to amplify our strength and our power, Vicki. Hi, everybody. So the demand of the Warheads to Windmills Coalition is very unequivocal and clear. It says to the US and the other eight nuclear armed nations, eliminate your nuclear weapons now, use the money, brain power, jobs, and infrastructure to cut global carbon emissions in half by 2030 and to no more than the earth can absorb by 2050. And the members of the uh, National Coalition so far are organizations like Peace Action, World Beyond War, Code Pink, Pax Christi, Wilp uh, US, Veterans for Peace, Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. And uh, at the state level, we have more climate organizations, and we're really working to build climate and peace organizations at, at every level. Um, an example of the local level is the Massachusetts Coalition. We have <clears throat> excuse me, Climate Action Now, 350 Mass, and other organizations. And Evelyn told you about the coalition bill 
in, uh, in Massachusetts. So when organizations join the coalition, the Warheads to Win Most Coalition, um, they can expect that emails and meetings will be minimal, but they can expect to help build a powerful movement to work together on educating the public and politicians that we don't need or want nuclear weapons, we don't need or want to keep burning fossil fuels, and in fact, if we want to survive, we have to abolish both. So as a coalition, we're building tools for political advocacy. Um, in January, we had 120 organizations at every level uh, signing a letter to President Biden, urging him to sign the nuclear ban treaty. And the president should also join calls for a fossil fuel treaty to phase out all burning of fossil fuels while ensuring a just transition. And we work together on a wonderful piece of national legislation. Uh, it's HR 2775, the Nuclear Weapons Abolition, Abolition and Climate Conversion Bill, which if we were to pass that, it would uh, we could all go on vacation for a little while. Uh, introduced by Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, it calls on the United States to sign the Nuclear Ban Treaty to ensure the total elimination of nuclear weapons and convert all those wasted human and financial resources into the green technologies needed to address the climate crisis and other pressing human needs, the warheads to windmills bill. So we don't expect that bill to pass in the current Congress, but we are uh, laying groundwork, we're building momentum, we're changing the conversation. And that bill is, is a tremendously powerful symbol of, of our goal. Uh, it's unequivocal, it's no nonsense, it's abolition. And it is a federal bill. Um, but that's not enough. We had successful lobby days in July. We visited 50 members of Congress. We added four signatories to the um, co-sponsoring co the Norton bill. Um, but we don't have enough yet. And we're aiming for a critical mass of members, um, starting with a progressive caucus, because they're uh, we would imagine the the easiest to get. Um, you know, the, so far we only have a dozen who are willing to stand up for the minimum that we need to survive. Um, so, in order to build more support in Congress, we have to get to the root of the problem. So, in addition to talking to Congress, we have to pressure the profiteers. We have to break the cycle of propaganda, corporate lobbying, and funding campaigns revolving door jobs for politicians in the military industrial complex. So we are working with uh, Don't Bank on the Bomb. Uh, we're working on uh, boycotting, at, especially at the city level, because there aren't very many consumer products anymore made by the same companies. But if, for example, here in Northampton, if a company wants to do business with the city, they have to tick a box showing that they are not involved in nuclear weapons. Um, and we have to um, bust the myths that we uh, that we need these things, that there's no alternative, um, that deterrence is is real. Um, so thank, if you want, thank you, just for wrapping up, one minute for me. One minute, okay. Thank you. So you can participate as an individual. There's a great tool for writing carefully tailored letters on uh, the Warheads to Windmills website uh, to members of Congress, but we'll really have more momentum as more and more climate and peace organizations join the coalition and we can take actions and mass and solve this problem once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vicki, for your inspiring words and um, getting us all galvanized. Now we'd like to hear from Robert Pollan. You are on, Robert. And you can begin speaking while we switch over the images, Robert. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this, and thank you very much for having me. Um, so uh, I want to make just a couple of very, very simple points that really build on what other speakers have already addressed with respect to both climate issue and um, nuclear. So uh, first of all, um, there's yes, there's a range of climate solutions, and we've heard um, some really good thoughts with respect to that. And I, I just want to focus back on the most simple, straightforward, and also most important uh, climate solution, which indeed is to abolish fossil fuels. 
uh, I know it's been it been highlighted already, but I want to re-highlight it uh, because if we're talking about uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 80% of the solution, 75, 80% is burning fossil fuels to produce energy. So if we're going to uh, have any chance of stabilizing the climate, we have to start there and yes, fight vehemently against all the interests that are supporting fossil fuels. Now, in doing that, we also have to be equally cognizant about creating alternative uh, clean energy systems. And alternative energy entails both investments in high efficiency and uh, renewable energy, as well as things like alternative transportation, uh, clean transportation that we've heard about. Now, in doing that, it is important in building a movement, in my view, for people to understand that there are important co-benefits of uh, advancing an alternative global energy system in terms of public health, um, in terms of access to energy itself, uh, affordable energy. And third, the one I want to emphasize a bit more right now is in terms of job creation. We've heard already, and it's true, that uh, the nuclear industry promotes job creation. Any investment will produce job creation. And the question is how, uh, how many jobs, how significant is the job creation? And some of the research that I've done in conjunction with activist groups demonstrates that advancing a, a clean energy agenda is a far superior source of job creation than anything to do with either the fossil fuel industry or the nuclear industry. So we need to make that point clear. At the same time, if we're talking about jobs and we're talking about building an active, uh, formidable, powerful movement, we have to recognize with respect to uh, abolishing fossil, fossil fuels, just as with abolishing nuclear weapons, that there will be jobs lost. Specifically, there will be jobs lost in the fossil fuel industry. And that will impact families that are dependent on these jobs and their communities. So uh, one of the things that has not come up that I want to emphasize as part of a, uh, a climate movement is to put in a central place the role of just transition. And specifically, I mean a just transition that uh, looks at the conditions and, and provides benefits and uh, and supports the well-being of the workers and families and communities that are currently dependent on the fossil fuel industry. Now, uh, the next thing I wanna mention is with respect to building an alternative energy system is a question that comes up a lot in progressive circles, which is should nuclear energy be part of a climate solution? Uh, a lot of very prominent, respected, indeed progressive people uh, are advocating strongly for nuclear energy as a climate solution because generating electricity through nuclear power does not emit uh, um, carbon or greenhouse gases, and including people like James Hansen, probably the single most prominent climate scientist in the world. Uh, I'm going to say uh, no, that nuclear energy should not be seen as part of the climate uh, solution and indeed the way one way through which we join the climate movement and the anti-nuclear movement is to stick very very strongly to the idea that we can solve the climate crisis without having to depend on nuclear energy and without a lot of time I'll just say two things about the nuclear uh, issue with respect to energy generation number one according to every source including the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy, nuclear energy per unit of kilowatt uh, electricity is about twice as high as wind and solar right now without any, without any subsidies. So in the area of cost, there's no argument in behalf of nuclear. Secondly, and far more important, and uh, to speaking directly to this conference, are the ongoing dangers associated with maintaining and indeed expanding nuclear capacity. James Hansen himself is calling for a tenfold increase in nuclear power plants. And all of the dangers associated with nuclear power have come to the fore as a result of the Ukraine war, 
We know, for example, that the, one of the very first things that Russia did after invading Ukraine was to seize control of the Chernobyl and the Zaporizhia uh, power plant, the largest one in uh, Europe. And let thank me just you. read to you. Some sorry, excuse me. I'm sorry also. But thank you for wrapping up and concluding your remarks just to make sure we stay on, on target here. It's Kathleen. Thank you so much. If you could just finish that thought. It's so deep, but. Uh, okay, I will just then read one quote from uh, Rafael Grossi, the head of the Nuclear um, Atomic Energy Commission International, talking about the uh, nuclear power plants in Zephyrisa and, and Ukraine, that the situation is completely out of control, quote, uh, it, it has generated a very real risk of nuclear disaster. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN uh, is quoting as saying, any potential to damage to the Zephyrisia plant is suicide. That's what we're dealing with in maintaining the dependence on nuclear power as an energy source. Thank you so much, Robert. Those were really incredibly important words about just transition and uh, basically nuclear power plants is nuclear weapons in waiting. Um, I'd now like to turn things over to um, Alice Slater for your brief comments. Alice, and then we'll follow um, with Indigo Olivier, and then we'll be in our breakout groups. So Alice, you are on. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I don't know why I'm like kind of small. Oh, there we go. There you are. <laughs> um, Following up on Robert Pollan, because I was going to talk a bit about nuclear power as, as an end to making alliances with the energy uh, folks and, you know, and, and, and even expanding because when we had the a huge uh, march in New York this month for the, uh, against fossil fuels, we had a climate section in the march and Code Pink that I work with, we had a huge blow up of a pink elephant and called the, the, uh, the, um, the energy uh, fossil fuel is the pink elephant in the room and nuclear power is the pink, the military is the pink elephant in the room. Nobody's talking about all the money, not only the money that goes to militarism that could be reapplied, but the amount of pollution that the military creates. And in the nuclear area, it's really awful. But I live in New York City. I'm 25 miles from Indian Point. We worked for years to close it down. And when 911 occurred and they had the Al Qaeda documents and they knocked down the World Trade Center, in their documents, they were considering Indian Point as a target. And that would have made us into Chernobyl or Fukushima. And right now, Fukushima is dumping their waste into the Pacific Ocean. It's going to go all over the planet. And that's making climate people aware, people that want to have clean water and, the, and not kill all the fish off. You know, this is the, the thing about nuclear waste is that it lasts sometimes for a million years, it, at least 100,000 years, some of it like a minimum, we actually stopped them from throwing it in a hole in the ground in Nevada and Yucca Mountain because we had a Nevada uh, a House representative was chairman and speaker of the house and he stopped them from putting it in. They were gonna bury it, but what happens after they bury it? I mean, in, in a couple of years, it's gone. Here in New York, where I'm living, Holtec took, we got the thing closed, but it was some kind of really nasty deal where the, where the governor made a deal to give another 10 billion to three upstate nuclear power plants to close Indian Point, the one near New York. And now we're dealing with the cleanup and the waste and they wanted to dump the tritiated water in the river, the Hudson River. And this was a huge grassroots campaign with environmentalists. Now, nuclear power, these environmentalists are now getting into these other networks throughout the country where we are shutting down nuclear weapons systems. We've created a horror at Hanford where they did the uranium in, in, uh, in, um, in Ohio, Paducah, Kentucky. They 
they enriched uranium for the bomb. There's horrible pollution in the water in St. Louis. They have plants all over the Hanford, uh, Amarillo, Texas, on the top of the Ogallala Aquifer, the world's largest freshwater aquifer. So I I, one minute remaining or, or less, if you could wrap so up. So just to get back to where Bob was talking, I thought that when Russia invaded Ukraine, you know, after there was 13 years of, they killed about 13,000 people in the Donbass before they invaded, you know, the first thing he did, he went to all the nuclear power plants and took them over. And I think he just didn't want Ukraine to get their hands on the bomb because the, the Ukrainians that, that Russia was afraid of came out of the Nazi tradition. You know, they were invading the Donbass with swastikas. I mean, there's such insanity going on and our media doesn't tell us. So I think uh, it's terrible what they did there, but then you can't trust the IAEA. I mean, they tell you that there's no- Thank you, no thank you, Alan. Uh, I'm sorry, oh. I, Kathleen here, just I'm the moderator on the timing. So we're gonna move on now. And if you wanna just conclude that sentence would be wonderful. Yes, I mean, you can't trust the International Atomic Energy Agency because it's corrupted like our nuclear regulatory agency, like our Pentagon people. They are paid by the industry to lie about the health effects and what, and they say it's a beneath regulatory concern when they talk about the tritium that Holtec was gonna dump in the Hudson. I mean, that's ridiculous. Thank you, Thank you. Indigo. I believe you're the next speaker. I'm, I hope you're up, uh, ready to go. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Yes, uh, Indigo, please. Uh, unmute yourself and begin. Hi. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I know this talk is focused on nuclear energy, but um, to the extent possible, um, I always try to connect militarism to an economy-wide project. Um, I was on a talk about um, nuclear energy with Frida Berrigan, and she mentioned psychic numbing, and I thought, you know, we aren't doing duck and cover anymore. Um, so I think a lot of the violence associated with the Pentagon isn't associated with nuclear weapons. You know, we are we're doing code reds. We associate militarism with policing and wireless surveillance and drones and economic san sanctions. So I think to the extent that um, we can paint that larger picture in order to see how we could maybe change some, some of those budgetary priorities to a more of a positive vision um, that creates jobs uh, for, for the climate. I, you know, I, that's kind of how I focus my work. Um, you know, where I see that happening, and again, I'm, I'm kind of biased because my husband's a labor lawyer and he's working for the UAW, but where I see that happening a lot is um, in the auto sector. They're actively trying to prevent, uh, present a, um, a tangible vision for what a just transition can look like and, and attach it to jobs with higher wages. And, you know, they're working with the White House to do that. Ironically, you, the UAW also, you know, represents a lot of aerospace workers for Lockheed Martin and, uh, you know, those bigger companies. Um, but I think we really need the labor movement um, to be on board with this because we need solid um, institutional structures to do this kind of work, you know, to the extent that we have bills that we're putting forward, like the Warheads to Windmill, uh, Windmills bill in Congress, we need, um, we need institutional coalitions and, and they're forming. I think we're in the middle of a paradigm shift. Um, I think the, like one of the clearest examples, I honestly thought I was, it was like a practical joke at first, but um, I'm sure many of you saw the pictures of Marjorie Taylor Greene standing next to Code Pink organizers who had occupied Bernie Sanders office uh, to cut funding to Ukraine. And I was like, oh my God, the world is completely upside down. What is going on? Why are Code Pink organizers getting arrested in Bernie Sanders' office? And to be completely honest, it's because Bernie Sanders is a jobs guy. You know, he he actually helped bring the F-35 to Burlington, Vermont. And it's, you know, he's, and it's it's this contradiction. He's like very against war. He's, he wants to cut the budget, but at the same time, he knows his constituents need those jobs. So, you know, for him, it was like, well, the F-35 already exists. And um, the question isn't whether it, we're going to abolish it completely. It's whether it's going to be in Vermont or be in Florida or something like that. Um, you know, obviously, we need more creative thinking um, if we're actually going to um, cut the budget and 
ratchet down tensions. But again, that positive vision, I think, isn't necessarily purely focused on abolishing nuclear weapons. It's more um, like shifting, like working with that paradigm sh shift and um, showing alternatives. Like we, we need to promote diplomacy and communication and consensus. So it's Thank you, Indigo. This is Kathleen. We are wrapping up and moving on to the breakout session. So if you want to finish those thoughts and lead us towards our ability to have everybody uh, speaking shortly would be great. Thank you. Yeah, to the extent that we can um, put forward that positive vision and connect it to what our negative vision is, and in this case, nuclear weapons, um, and kind of just shift the entire thinking, the more associations we have with different weapons, um, you know, we've, we've got to flip, flip those reframing for me. Um, I think the most kind of like poetic image of that is um, the F-35, which is just like the epitome of waste and excess in the, the military and student debt, because that is the inverse of that. And coincidentally, they are both about uh, $1.7 trillion outstanding. So I try to use that as like a device to connect it to students' personal lives so that they, they can feel this issue personally. Thank you so much, Indigo. So um, our, our panelists um, have covered some of the connecting points between building the climate justice movement and building a movement to abolish nuclear weapons. And now we want to give people some time in breakout groups so that everybody can have a chance to air some of their thoughts and feelings. And just to let folks know, that we're gonna be having people recording, make sure that there is someone recording um, in your group so that we can uh, uh, email out to everybody the essence of what's happened in all the breakout groups. So you will now be placed into um, breakout groups and a facilitator will join each group and then we'll come back for a five minute closing of the circle. And I really want to thank our last panel for making those key points about just transition is absolutely essential. Militarism and war is the worst thing ever for climate change. And that we really need to bring these two movements together and the all the jobs that we can create if we put our resources there. So um, breakout groups will commence and then we'll see everybody back here at five of two for a brief, but um, I think really important closing more circle. And thanks, and just a logistical point, I'm gonna be assigning people to breakout rooms, but if you have agreed to facilitate or take notes in a breakout room, if you could either hang here in the main room with us and we'll put you in, in those rooms individually just so it's balanced in that way. Yeah, thank um, thanks, and with that, I'll, I'll create the breakout rooms. Great. And while you're waiting to get in your breakout groups, you can begin thinking about what you might like to say. There's no separate link for the breakout system. It's a, well, it's from the mapper. It's from mapper. Oh, no, from Zoom. It says from Zoom. Okay. Ryan, is room three for Susan and me? Is that correct? Hey, can you put it? Can you can you unfocus, uh, Susan, so that we can see who's left? Yes, yes, I can. Um, <laughs> okay, all you folks need to be put in breakout rooms. Great. Got it. So people should have uh, an invitation to join on the screen. If you're uh, one of the facilitators, stay here in the main room. Um, if not, go ahead to your to your breakout rooms. We've got all but 34 in there, so we're making progress. And how many rooms are there? Do we know? Uh, I made 14 rooms to adjust it down. Um, okay, so. so we had a couple of people. So should just each of the facilitators join a room or? Yes. Well, how, so do, we, how do we do that? I mean, you'll you'll have to put people in so that they we get one each. I will. Except for do um, them one by one. Susan and and Evelyn are going to do it together. Is that right? Yep. Mm hmm And then and Brian, see what's left. Brian, you already put me in room six. And whoever whoever is left in this room can be a breakout room with um, 
was Kathleen. Is Kathleen still here? Kathleen was going to do uh, notes with me. If she Susan, was... uh, Alvillain's going to do notes with you. Kathleen is going to stay in the. Oh, okay. I but I don't see Kathleen. I don't see her. She might have left. You can return to the main room if you want, but I will send you and uh, uh, I will send you, Susan, and you, Evelyn, to the same room. And which room is that? Because you said put me in room six. Just go whatever room he puts you in. <laughs> well, he had put me in and six. I, and I moved. Oh, uh, Kathleen Evelyn did move to, to a breakout six. room. She's in 11. Okay. So should I join six now? Yep. yep. Okay. You yeah. should. Uh, and when you need to be put in a breakout room as a facilitator, yep. I would assume. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's find you. If all the facilitators raise their hands, maybe Brian will know who. That would make it helpful. Raise your, your digital hand if you can. Um, I'm available if we if we need one more. So down so. Um, all right, so uh, you can go ahead and uh, and join that room then, Tim. Well, I'll make sure you got enough. So there's Peter hasn't got his yep. hand. You, uh, you're you're fine. We have more than enough. Okay, okay. So whoever offered to be a facilitator and we don't need you, then please just join a breakout room. And thanks so much for agreeing. Yep, and Cheryl, you can join that the room that you've been assigned to seven. That'll work out nicely. Should I go to two or? You need me to move. I think you can go to two. Nick, I think as well, you can go to eight. Right. Uh, I don't see the breakout rooms in the bottom of my thing. Where, where... Uh, John, you should be able to go to room nine. Oh, I choose that. It's the breakout room. Seven, seven, eight. Uh, Marilyn as well can go to room 10. Uh, let's see. Ellen, you can go to room 11, please. Let's see. Kathleen is in room 11 right now, moderating. Oh, okay. I thought she was going to return to, to do the main yeah. room. So um, we should get this group going in here talking and Ivana and I in a breakout room. And then this group should start having your breakout group because you'll run out of time. Mm -hmm. um, Rosalie, you can join room two. That should be fine. And Asher could join room three. That would be great. So it's just Vicky and Doug. Okay, uh, I am going to send you, Doug, to room 13. And Vicki, if I can find you here. Where are you, Vicki? Oh, okay, assigned to room 14. And Ivana, I will put you in room 14 as well, because that's where Susan is. Excellent. Then, Thank you so much. Yep. Sorry, there's always, it's always a bit of a process. No, 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 no you're doing a, a fabulous job. Thank you. And I'm very happy to stay with everyone else here, uh, if that works. If people want to unmute themselves, you can, um, you now have that ability. And this is just a time for us to reflect about what we've heard today uh, and to ask any questions uh, that we have. 
Uh, hi, everybody. Kat Haber here, zooming in from Homer, Alaska. Uh, thanks for hosting this important conversation. It's timely. I was just in a, two groups this morning. One, uh, a nuclear nonproliferation Rotary International Group, and another a TEDx Veil or, or TEDx organizers from around the world. And um, yeah, the question about how do we deal simultaneously with biodiversity loss, climate change, and nuclear uh, existential threats is weighs heavily on my heart this morning. I was very happy to hear this conversation. That's all. Yeah, I find that uh, very interesting. It seems like being up in Alaska, those might be issues that are all very relevant to your state. You know, obviously we're, it seems like we're feeling the effects of climate change. The further north or south you get, the change is more dramatic. Um, I'm not certain of it, but I would be shocked to hear that there weren't any nuclear bases in Alaska. There must be, right? Oh, yeah. In fact, Eielson Air Force Base has a contract to install a small nuclear reactor that should be functional by uh, 2027. We also have a squadron of F-35s here installed by our Republican senators. And we have your, the threat of uranium mines all over the state in what are otherwise indigenous communities and wilderness areas. So I am not, I'm also a TEDx organizer. So uh, whenever I get a chance to say that nuclear is not the solution, I do because I see the real damage that it does here. That's all. Yeah, and there's also a lot of oil up there. But the thing that could be a counterbalance to that, I would think, is that a lot of folks up there are probably up there because they love the majesty of the nature. Um, right. So how do you and feel so, that those two, um, that yeah. how do you feel that conflict, those two, you know, groups uh, butting up against each other are people compartmentalizing it? Um, the way our state runs uh, financially, 90% of our state budget is derived from one sector, the oil and gas industry. And here I live in Homer, which is five hours south of Anchorage. Anchorage is where half of Alaskans live. Mm -hmm. Up at the North Slope is where most of the oil and gas comes from, although some of it comes from across Homer and the lower Cook Inlet. Uh, so the way it works is people from all around the state and actually all around the country and the world have a two week on and a two week off. So we have our people have their foot in one community and then go up there and work and then do this kind of thing in their life. And we just got approved an 800 mile pipeline uh, which is they're trying to regenerate the economic prosperity of the 70s. And um, Willow just got approved by President Biden to have um, extraction there. Extraction and wilderness are incompatible. They took out one word, the word not, saying that there will not be any drilling in this area. The Republicans in recent, this last Congress, took out that word not and added a fifth component to the conditions under which the Bureau of Land Management can uh, drill in that area. So it said it went from it's not compatible to saying it is compatible and it must take place. Uh, so we can, we can actually testify on that with uh, the... Bureau of Land Management right now and have our voices heard. That's all. Patrick and, and Vicky and, and Lena, if you can, if, I'm not sure if it's asked. Oh, there you are. You're unmuted. I want to bring you all into this conversation as well. What just any reactions of what you've heard today or, um, you know, ideas that it, that it gave you. Sometimes it spurs on, you know, just hearing all of these excellent panelists 
gives you gives you thoughts, you know, that maybe we didn't cover. Well, I can tell a little story. Um, I in Washington D.C. near the Pentagon, there was a event, an annual event called the Deterrence Summit, and I went to it because I wanted to know what was going on when, <clears throat> you know, corporate contractors and military officials and White House representatives and senators are all in the same room talking about nuclear weapons. And uh, Tim told me I would need therapy afterward, and I, and I did. Um, you know, there are 530 of these people, and I found out what they talk about when they're alone together. And the nutshell is that they, they think nuclear deterrence is a normal thing and like there's no alternative. I mean, just even calling it a deterrence summit seems so laughable to me because we know that that's a myth, but this is how they make their living. So they talk about continually building ever more destructive weapons because they believe that's what keeps everybody safe from current and future adversaries. They're not very interested in safety. They are in fact kind of dismissive um, they're not interested in collateral damage. They're not interested in unintended consequences, but consensus, they are so grateful that there's perpetual bipartisan support that keeps them well-funded. And I imagine it's exactly the same in the fossil fuels industry. So, um, you know, that's why we need to go after the profiteers as well as the politicians and, you know, break the back of this monster that doesn't prioritize human survival um yeah hey, now you, you just gave me chills uh i just had a chill run up my spine vicky so thanks for that yeah, but I now you need therapy shows. as well i'm sorry yeah no um, no but, no but, i mean it's but the, we've got it we just got to do the work what else are we going to do you know we have to stop this and we can't yeah. we have the tools we just have to do it and for that we need a big movement we need to coordinate between climate and, and peace activists and and just go for it. No holds barred and don't wait. And I do think that that's a huge uh, uh, aspect that we didn't really, did we didn't talk much or at all about today. And that's the myth of deterrence. Oh, I do yeah. think a lot, it's not just our leaders. I think it's a lot of the populace as well. Yeah. Oh, are yeah. sort of caught up, it can't happen. You know, the worst can happen and actually, you know, investing more in this kind of self-defeating technology is going to keep us safe just like Don't you said. we need those to keep us safe people say oh no <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm just terrified that the thing that's going to shape wake people up is going to be so terrible that you know it's even beyond our our comprehension um but uh i, I see that it's 155 susan you're muted i, I know you're, yes I'm i was gonna... just going to unmute and say can you bring us back the yep back exactly to uh, so something positive <laughs> in 60 positive. seconds we'll yeah. all come back yeah yeah positive that's how it works. positive yes yeah yeah we talk about some of the major themes and how we're building this movement yeah yeah well what you said there vicky is they're so happy that but that everyone in a bipartisan way is supporting that way of thinking so it seems to me that that's what we need to break yep so that and gives think, us something you know, to do one thing that's really startled, startled me in the last few years is how things can happen politically that we never imagined in a million years would happen. And most of those things have been kind of uh, abysmal and shocking and terrifying and destructive. But it's also true that amazing and astonishing things can happen that we don't expect also. And you know, if we build enough of a, of a movement to support those good things when they when they start to pop up to, to create that tipping point, that critical mass, you know, that's, that's our hope. Okay. Thanks, Vicki. Um, it looks like we're coming back. Are we all back, Brian? We are all back. All right. Indeed. Fantastic. So, um, well, we know that this was only two hours, just a moment in time. There, there is um, so much more to be said, but it felt to me certainly today that I really heard some real thinking along paradigm shifts in the the power that happens when we bring these two movements together. And um, uh, we wanted to just close on a few of the really noteworthy themes that we heard today to keep building on and, 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 and expanding our movements. One is this notion of a just transition, which means that workers that are losing their jobs, we need to find 
good paying jobs for folks with health and safety conditions. And that will build our movement right there because that's always been a stumbling block. Second of all, really respecting and honoring the leadership of indigenous communities and frontline communities. If we can unite around no more sacrifice zones as uh, Naya talked about in Springfield, such an important theme, again, to build that movement and to really address the profound impact of white supremacy on dividing movements. We need to do everything we can to bring those movements together. The third is um, the impact of militarism, as um, some people spoke to, that war is basically only, um, you know, just um, speeding up a move toward climate disaster war is incredibly polluting and that needs to get named at every at every point. And um, that I was so uh, heartened to hear uh, Robert Poland speak about nuclear power is um, basically uh, nuclear power is not the answer and that if anything, it can be weaponized so easily. So those are a few key points. Ivana has, um, a couple more thoughts to share, and then we'll do a very quick wrap and send everybody home. But Ivana. Yes, thank you, Susan. Thank you for that um, excellent overview of some, just some of the things that we heard today. I was struck by um, the multitudes of solutions uh, on climate change and really just this need for all of these um, different solutions to come together uh, and, um, of course, in the nuclear weapons sector, we have a solution. The solution isn't, it's just eliminating the weapons. That, that part is really clear. Um, and I'm grateful, Susan, that you underscored um, the issues of frontline communities. That's of course, that hasn't com come up in our conversation today on nuclear weapons, but that has been the theme of nuclear weapons. Their use and testing and development have had um, uh, devastating humanitarian consequences actually on communities, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And actually the nuclear age, and this is just sort of hot off the press, just this um, past week, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation has been supporting two governments of the United Nations, um, the Kiribati and Kazakhstan, uh, to bring forth a, a resolution at the UN General Assembly on assisting victims in remediating envi uh, um, contaminated environments. So that's just something, you know, one other piece of this. And I love when Paul Gunter said, act local, think global. There are just so many ways that we can tackle these issues. And I've um, so enjoyed uh, all of the discussions and, and facilitating this with Susan. Well, that was a that yeah, was a great joy for me as well. And just want to close on uh, two notes. One is deep appreciation to the organizers, the speakers, the tech team, small group facilitators, co-sponsors, and especially to every one of you who showed up today to put your heart and soul and attention on building and amplifying these two existential movements. And um, to just um, really appreciate that we've started a process, it's one step. We hope that we can see, um, continue this conversation, build this community, expand this community and, and just amplify these movements because basically this is about preserving an ecosystem where life can continue to exist. So thank you all so much for being here today. And- um, Thank you everyone. Thank yes. you, Susan. Thank you to everyone who was involved in organizing this and Brian for helping behind the scenes with all of the technical work. Thank you. Thanks, so thanks to Ivana and Susan for, for guiding us through the whole day. Thank you so much. Be well, everybody, and take care of each other and be kind. Stay well. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.